Hey everyone, welcome to the Patriot Art Show, and I'm your host, John McNaughton, and I'm in my studio here, just hanging out, uh, and I'm just going to be talking to you today about some different things going on in the McNaughton art world, uh, and your world as well. Uh, the country is just, the world is going through so much right now, um, so we're going to touch on some interesting things today, and I've got my my good friend Seth Adam Smith with me. And hey guys, Seth is one of our hosts. <laughs> wow. And uh, or my producer. <laughs> yeah, that's probably and more accurate. That's more accurate. And so anyway, um, we do this show uh, once a week, and we just talk about different things that I'm doing with my artwork as it relates to the political arena, because that's what I'm about. I I paint historical politics. From a conservative point of view and uh, i'm excited to about some of the stuff we're going to talk about today but to begin with i want to uh, tell you some interesting things going on with my recent release which was the painting uh, the emperor has no clothes have you seen this painting that's the new one i just came out with and uh, i've got some videos on my youtube channel where i talk about uh, some of the meaning behind this painting, uh, you know, some of the more things that maybe you wouldn't know about. Uh, but I've had some really interesting responses. Uh, you know, I like to read some of the comments and especially the ones where people uh, from the other side of the aisle on the left like to comment. And uh, of course, they don't like this painting, but uh, I think it truly represents what is happening in the White House today, where a lot of the people that support uh, Joe Biden, you know, they're they're well aware of the problem, but everybody pretends like there's no problem. And so that's why you have all these different political figures, including uh, heads of state of China and Russia in the painting itself. So the kind of things uh, the, <laughs> that the left has been responded, you know, nobody's made any complaint about the fact that Biden's naked. <laughs> I thought that was going to be, like, that's so gross. I can't believe it's immoral that you would do that. Well, nobody said anything and that's good. I mean, it is based on the Hans Christian Andersen fable, uh, you know, the emperor's new clothes. Uh, I, I thought it would be fun to have one of his legs sticking out with his, uh, you know, furry, uh, blonde hair showing because of the time uh, Biden made that that little story uh, comment about how the kids at the pool love to rub his hairy legs. I just <laughs> do you remember that, Seth? Yeah, yeah, I'm on the campaign trail. Where, you know, Creepy. Like to come up and rub my yeah. hair. Right? Well, you see, and, you know, you have the little boy pointing, and he's he's the only one in the room that's pointing out the obvious. That guy's naked, and so. You know, the kind of responses that the painting is garnered is that's exactly what's going on. And um, and honestly, this painting has not been trolled as much as some of my others, uh, which is surprising. I mean, usually yeah. it's a 50-50. I'll get like 50% that will comment, uh, you know, people that understand the painting agree with it. And the other 50 try to think, try to outdo each other, you know, with the best insult. And this picture has not received as much of that, well, probably think, because they realize it's obviously true. <laughs> yeah, I I do. I believe that if they brought attention to it, it's it's as if they're they're that little boy pointing out the obvious, and they exactly. don't want to point out the obvious right now. Exactly. Um, but there was one. There has been a consistent comment uh, from people. Uh, who I think don't know for sure where I stand on Putin. You know, a lot of people say, why did you put Putin in this painting? Putin should not be in this painting. And I wonder if they're thinking that, uh, you know, Putin, uh, they like either they like Putin or they think that Putin, uh, you know, would not support Biden or, you know, he's not in the same league as these uh, misfits that are in the background. So I thought maybe I should take a minute and kind of explain my reasoning of why I put Putin in the picture. You know, having heads of state like uh, Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin pretty much 
make the point that having somebody like Joe Biden uh, in charge of the country makes it easier for them to uh, do the things that they want to do geopolitically. You know, right now, I don't believe that Putin would have invaded Ukraine uh, if President Trump was in office. Uh, if you look at uh, the things that have happened in the last, in the, in the former presidents, you know, uh, you know, Russia pretty much was able to do whatever they wanted. But while Trump was in there, they knew there was a, a red line they could not cross. And that's my opinion because of listening to how Trump has, has talked to them. But as soon as uh, Biden gets in there, um, you know, they they do what they're going to do because Biden hasn't been real tough. Uh, on his foreign policy, yeah. Well, he senses uh, he senses weakness. If if you ever wanted to go uh, and see the the first meeting between, you can Google this on YouTube. Mm -hmm. uh, the the first meeting between Obama and Putin, it is stunning because Putin is they're having breakfast together, and Putin is sitting at a table and he's just leaned back the entire meeting, just lean back. <laughs> and Obama's like leaning forward like a little kid the entire time. Right. And at one point, um, he turns to his his KGB buddies. I mean, that's all they they're all all KGB former agents. He turns to him and they're just they're just laughing at him in Russian. They're making <laughs> jokes about Obama in Russian. He senses this weakness, which is why during Obama's tenure as president, um uh Putin invaded Crimea. And then right. he senses weakness in Biden, and so he invades Ukraine. There's weakness that he senses. Well, you know, Obama uh, with the deal in Syria, he said that there is a red line you shall not cross. And of course, Russia crosses that <laughs> red line and nothing happened. Nope. You know, I mean, it was like oh, Putin knows what he can do. Putin's not a dumb guy. You know, and you've been hearing Trump a lot lately talk about uh, his admiration for Putin. I mean, he'll come out and say, you know, yeah, Putin, he's he's a bad guy. I mean, he makes it clear that he's not a good person, but he respects, you know, him as a, as a leader, as somebody who um, is fighting for his own country. And it comes across as like, he's very, it's almost like he's cheering for the enemy. And I don't think that's what it is, you know, because Putin definitely is a bad guy. He's calm. He is, he is, uh, he's savvy to, he, he knows, a, he knows an enemy. Whereas all these Biden administrations, they're, they're all thinking, Oh, if we if we give them money, if we pay them off, that then you know they don't respect them. They think they're dumb. Like, you know? Let's negotiate. We got to be diplomatic. Yep. yep. You know, people like Putin, they only understand strength. They only stand a position of strength. You know, I love that clip where uh, Trump is meeting Vladimir Putin, and Putin walks towards him, and Trump puts his arm out and like almost yanks him in <laughs> close to him. Have you seen that? <laughs> Yeah, and he's and like three inches taller than him, and he's it like almost like it almost causes <laughs> Putin's head to go. Oh. <laughs> he's like well, pulls him right in. Yeah. And I'm thinking, wow, that's that's a that's that shows a lot of uh, of strength, I guess. Um, well, then Trump Trump said, you know, and and I I believe there is a clip of this as well. But when they're having a meeting, he's like, if you if you invade Ukraine, if you do anything with Ukraine, I will bomb Moscow immediately. Right. All those big, beautiful dome buildings, they're going to be blown up, you know, and, and Putin's like, what? <laughs> yeah, and everybody gives Trump a hard time when he talks like that. I mean, you remember how he talked to Kim Jong-un that way? Yeah. You know, he yeah. called him the little rocket man and that he was going to blow him up if they do anything. I mean, he talks tough. And, uh, you know, that's the language a lot of these rulers, these world leaders understand. So let's go to, um, let's start the sketch. Uh, today I did a sketch of uh, President Trump with a quote um, right before the election in 2020. So I'm going to have this plane, and um, I didn't I didn't speed this up. You're actually watching me draw this in real time. This is how fast I draw these. So I'll have this going on the screen while we continue to talk about this. And what's the style that you do? It's it's is it cross stitching? Is it what is it called? Cross stitching? No, I don't do cross stitching. Well, I didn't mean to say <laughs> that. Mean, no, it's it's a cross hatch. Cross meaning hatch. That the strokes. But when go, you're when you're go when different directions. In the winter, you'll do cross stitching. Is <laughs> the strokes go different directions? It's kind of like you're. I, I compare it to 
as if I was sculpting, you know, and the, 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 the sculpting hammers going different directions as I chip away at my drawing. And it creates kind of this uh, illusion of depth and form. So I'm getting artsy fartsy on you, but um, it's kind of an old master's method and it's very effective to really create a convincing drawing with as few of strokes as possible. So it allows me to draw something like this in not a, a, a great amount of time. I mean, it took me about 23 minutes or so. That's how long the video was. But um, it, it's a very, I think it's a beautiful way to draw. And so that's what I'm doing here. I always start with the eye. You know, the, the, uh, the main, there's actually a, a dominant eye in every drawing. And so I pick the dominant eye and I start working on that. And the eye, as they say, is the window to the soul. So if you can get the eye right, it really captures the mood of the figure that you're working on. So that's that's what I'm doing here. I'm just started on Trump, and um, it'll have a really cool quote. So you know, going back to Trump, um, you know, one of the things about his administration was he was really good at making us energy independent. You know, for the first time, America did not need foreign oil to take care of our needs. We had a surplus. And what happened to our gas prices when he was president? They were way freaking low. How low did it get? Do you remember? Um, I mean, I remember it being under $2. And I was in Arizona at the time. I was in uh, um, Santan Valley at the time, and it was under $2. Seems like I remember it being like 165 at one point. Yeah. So it's like ridiculously low. And, you know, it's important to have energy independence, if anything, for security purposes. You know, what happens if 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 uh, war breaks out somewhere and, you know, we have to rely on another country to, to, to supply our oil needs? I mean, it could literally bring a country to its knees. Yeah. You know, and so, you know, Trump really was doing everything he could to watch out for the American people in every way. It, it's uh, it's pretty remarkable. Um, even his foreign policy, the things he did. Uh, I remember when when uh, he met with all the different he had there was like some world summit in Germany or something like that. And, yeah, and they had all these leaders there. And he said, hey, how come you're buying oil from Russia? Here we mm -hmm. are. Uh, the NATO alliance, and we're paying everything. You're, you haven't been paying your fair share. You're supposed to pay a certain amount every year. You haven't been doing that, and yet you're buying oil from Russia. That's the main purpose we even have this NATO agreement. Mm -hmm. And so they immediately, you know, because Trump, the way he is, he he's like, we're not going to take care. We're not going to do this anymore unless you pay up. So immediately, billions of dollars went into the coffers. And this is why they hated Trump so much, the establishment, because, I mean, the guy was he was fearless. Yeah, he was ruthless. I mean, and that was there's that clip that was going viral last week, essentially. Uh, I believe it was the G20 summit uh, where okay. he's the United Nations. He was speaking and he was saying, look, Germany, you're if you're not careful, you're going you're on track to be completely dependent on Russia for all of your natural yeah. gas and and fuel and energy and it and it cuts to them the camera cuts to them and they're laughing at trump they think oh this is such a joke ha <laughs> ha what does he know and then you cut to now that's just like two or three years later yeah yeah and they're yeah. like well um we can't we can't do anything because we're completely dependent on russia they said that it was the chancellor came out and said well we're not gonna we're not gonna cut ties with russia because they're our strategic partner meaning they are funding um, and in large part, they're funding the war in Ukraine right now. They're, they're so naive. There's no foresight in their leadership. You know, here you have a country like Russia uh, that literally is um, like, a, like a big bear, you know, that um, could erupt at any moment under the right circumstances. Uh, I mean, the, 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 the dynamics in their economies over there and the situation in Russia compared to what's going on with uh, the European Union, NATO, the United States, um, it's, it's really interesting. And, you know, it's as an artist, you know, I focus most of my time on trying to think of ideas and expressions I can do 
to capture the feeling of what's going on uh, in our country. And so I read a lot of these things and I try to, to dig into different aspects of it, not just one side. So I'll read things that are more um, sympathetic to the, Russia's point of view, to, to Ukraine, to NATO, to the United States. You know, I, I, I try to dig in. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a scholar by any means, but I want to know what's going on. And I've learned, and Seth, you probably feel this way too, but you just can't take anything at face value, even from your own side. Yep. You know, you have to, to have a little bit of a, of a discernment, uh, skepticism, because there's so much, there's a propaganda war going on all around us. Um, it's, uh, it takes, it takes a lot of time and effort to try to dig up the truth. And so, you know, when Trump was president, uh, you know, I was very skeptical. I mean, they went so far in trying to berate Trump that it got to be such a joke that you almost stopped believing almost anything that the press was saying about Trump because it turned out to be garbage most of the time. But you still, anytime you'd hear something, you have to look into it. Like, you know, the whole deal with Ukraine that led to a, uh, an impeachment of the House turned out to be all false. But, you know, what was going on when all that came out? All this information, what's true, what's not? You know, so the American people have to sift through this constantly. Well, it's amazing how much Ukraine has played a pivotal role in American politics. Um Mm -hmm. Just you mentioned the the impeachment. I mean, it, there's so much corruption in Ukraine in general, and with the ambassador that the former ambassador, she was a a holdover from the Obama administration. Mm, right, she was right. out there testifying against Trump. I mean, it's it's amazing how much corruption is centralized uh, in Ukraine, and now there's a potential war happening in in Ukraine that would involve. All of these other countries, it's just, it fascinates me how it's all collecting right in there. Yeah, it is. It is pretty fascinating. And a lot of it really comes down to oil. And this is something that, that as I've researched it, uh, it they don't talk about it very much. But one of the, the things that has, has led to uh, the conflict in Ukraine is this battle over oil. You know, Russia... Um, you know, that's their main source of, of revenue for their country. You know, their GDP, pretty much most of it comes from the production and distribution of oil. Yeah. And so Ukraine, when they broke, broke away from the Soviet Union, became their own country. You know, they weren't really too worried about them, uh, you know, messing up that oil supply until they started discovering all these oil and natural gas reserves off the coast of Crimea. Mm -hmm. And also recently inside of Ukraine itself. And, and then Russia has to decide, okay, uh, if Ukraine takes all this, and I mean, it could actually become a, a, a security crisis for their country. And also all these other countries that have left the Soviet Union, and there's like seven of them that have already aligned themselves with NATO. And then the, the risk of Ukraine also doing that, that creates another security risk for Russia. Yeah. You know, so oil is a big deal. And um you know, Ukraine, they uh they're they're tied into our oil industry and I just found this out I just found this out today. I didn't know this. I've got a good friend who, who's in Texas. He's an executive in an oil drilling rig company. And he told me that uh well there's two parts to this. One is that even though oil right now is up to $109 a barrel, which is the highest they've seen in a long time. So that means a lot of people are making money, but there's so much regulation that makes it difficult to drill in the United States. But on top of that, and this is what blew my mind, he said that the steel that they use for the capping, I can't remember the exact word, but the capping that goes on the drills so that the drills don't bust. Is it the co coating? The not a coating. It's, it's like it's like a capping or a, a binding or a I, there was a word for it. But that steel comes out of Ukraine. And because of what's going on in Ukraine right now, they can't get that. 
and so it's put a it's put a real uh, damper on the whole drill drilling uh, rig business, making it more difficult for them to get oil out of the United States. And it just reminds me of how much re how reliant we are right now because of the Biden administration, where we went from being uh, energy independent under Trump to now having to not only get oil from other countries like Venezuela, uh, we stopped getting oil from. We, uh, Biden's no longer going to get oil from Russia, but now we're going to be getting oil from Iran or Venezuela. Yeah, these are they, these are not good countries. They're allies with Russia, so it's yeah. like. So what happens if a war starts to spread out more? The first thing they do is they stop stop selling oil to the United States. I mean, our oil reserves are going to be depleted pretty fast. Yep. You know, it's gonna it's gonna affect the average person from from uh, being able to afford to drive their car. And it, if it gets really bad, I mean, the truckers aren't going to be able to bring the food as well. The prices of goods go skyrocket. And then if we have a serious war and we have to put gas and oil in the, the military vehicles, that's going to be a first priority. Yeah. And so the risk is enormous. And these are what our leaders have done to us. Just like we were talking about the chancellor in Germany, how she's put her whole country at risk because of their reliance upon Russian oil. Well, and and the the oh, the premier of Alberta uh, came out. He, it was either t today or it was it was yesterday, and he said, "Look, if America is serious, if if Biden, if the Biden administration is serious about energy independence and all of that, and trying to get away from Russian oil, finish the pipeline here. Finish the pipeline that runs from finish Alberta the freaking into pipeline." But they won't. They that was won't the first thing that, that Biden ended when he became president. He stopped the whole pipeline thing. Yeah, they, they to, won. They had to let go like uh, between eleven and twenty thousand employees. I mean, it was the very first thing he did, day one. And I mean, and is, yeah, he, it's right. one of those moments where you want to throw your computer when it, when you're listening to Biden yeah. give a speech. You're just like, you cannot lie to us like this. And he's like, I'm not. I'm not doing anything. I'm not doing anything wrong. But he, want to throw he, my paintbrushes. <laughs> he put the he put the uh, in the executive order the same day was a was he said he suspended all all new leases for oil all right it's the same day and he's like I'm not I'm not doing anything you're no you're doing something you're lying you're lying to everybody that's what you're doing right now yeah. it's infuriating and it was Trump you know this you're gonna I know you put a quote here next to Trump but it is that same it was that same uh, speech he was giving. And he's like, you know, what is it now? What is it now? It's like $2. It's $2 now. He's like, that's like a tax break. It's better than a tax break. It's the gift that keeps on giving, you know? Yeah. And he well, knew it. He understood it. Uh, you know, and not just the oil and everything, but this whole inflation deal and, and you know, printing dollars like, like they're nobody's business. I mean, we're being taxed beyond our own. I mean, it's so out of control. People don't realize that inflation really is just a, another tax on the American people. You know, the, the Federal Reserve with the way they print dollars and the money supply. You know, Americans are getting fleeced like never before. Yeah. And, and the Biden administration keeps telling everybody, oh, it's going to be OK. We've never been so good. Oh, what a bunch of lion sacks. I mean, it's just. You know, the, the election is going to be coming up this November and heaven forbid uh, they don't get control of the mail-in ballots. But if we can take back control of the House and Senate with some real Republicans, not some lousy rhinos, uh, maybe we can uh, curtail some of this. But, you know, a lot of Americans are so discouraged about what's going on. And, and it seems like like our efforts have have just uh, crumbled in front of us, you know, so we have to continue to have hope. And I think that the more things are bad, like inflation and people losing their jobs and the way that COVID has been handled with all the lockdowns and lying about the vaccines and so much of this stuff going on, I think Americans might actually um, take a, a stance against the Biden administration. At least I hope so. Well, I actually think I'm a little bit more optimistic because Trump, Trump was like a living red pill. I mean, uh, he 
woke up so many people, especially in terms of the, the media, how fake it was. Mm -hmm. Somebody had posted this tweet. I can't, I'm not able to share it while I'm showing this video at the same time, but I'll read it because I yeah. think it was just so on point. And I think this is the legacy of Trump is that he woke people up to how corrupt uh, the government is right now. Um, so this is a tweet from Julia Song at mm -hmm. it's at Real Julia Song. That's her her screen name. And she wrote she wrote the S word first. I'll just say um, crap the is word. So she wrote, crap is so fake that the minute an outsider, meaning Trump, the minute an outsider took office, we got cheap gas, cheap food, became energy independent, no new wars, and focused on our country's own issues. The American establishment America. hacks get back in and we have inflation, medical tyranny, World War III, and we need to take out a mortgage for gas. And it's <laughs> so obvious now, like, the difference between the two people were complaining we had the best economy the best situation in our lives in our country yeah. under trump uh it wasn't good for him because he was getting battered on every side mm -hmm. but in terms of how the country was doing how we were doing day to day it was amazing and the difference could not be more stark it's totally stark i mean that's why i did that painting the emperor has no clothes because it's so obvious to everybody. If you just look, you know that the country is falling apart right in front of us. And yet all these uh, talking heads, the media, the people in charge are like, oh, everything is great. We've never been better. I mean, it is such a bunch of bunk. So, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So anyway, I've been, I just finished that painting. And right now I'm working on some other stuff. I'll talk, take a take a second and talk about that before we get back to the politics. I, so I've been working on um, my new NFT collection. You know, I did the Trump NFT, the Trump legacy collection, which did really well and continues to do well. And I'm going to be launching one called the Biden legacy collection, which is, uh, it's almost sarcastic because <laughs> his legacy is so bad. <laughs> And, and the uh, NFTs are going to be absolutely hilarious. And if you don't know what an NFT is, it's a non-fungible token, which basically is a it's a computerized digital image that you can own it, actual, actually have a certificate in the blockchain, which gives it value. So people that are into cryptocurrency stuff, you know, they they like these because they do increase in value and they're pretty, pretty cool. And they're nifty. That's why I call it micnifty.art. So you can check that out and you can see the new collection. But I've been working on those, um, all the little details in these, and that's been keeping me busy. And, and I've also been spending a lot more time on social media this last week. You know, I, I try different things. I've got a Facebook account and that I've had for quite a while. Um, but Facebook doesn't let me do ads and they pretty much throttled me to the point where my, my, uh, followers stay about the same. I, I can't grow it. And I've even but, tried to help you, um, fix it up and, and really we've hit a lot of dead ends on that. Like you're legit being throttled in a lot of ways. Yeah. And they do that to all conservatives. I had my Twitter account completely wiped. Uh, and that was an important way for me to, you know, get my new paintings out there. Uh, I've started up a Getter account, and I had a MeWe, and I had a Parlor. And we got a comment from Elizabeth Gallagher here, and she said, "I saw the Emperor's new clothes and shared it. The image, and they removed it." Ooh, can you believe Interesting. that? I Probably wonder because it showed chest hair on Biden. I mean, <laughs> we couldn't have that. No, 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 you couldn't, and. <laughs> And, and that's why they they censored uh, Hunter Biden's laptop because it showed a lot more than just chest hair. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, but I I wonder where uh, Elizabeth I wonder where that was at. It was that Facebook was that Twitter. Um, Twitter is obviously very. Twitter's, leftist. Twitter's the worst of all it's of the them. Worst of all of them. Um, Facebook pretty much they look for words, so you have to be careful. You know what words mm -hmm. you post. Um. But, uh, I mean, the painting was very well received. I think people get the message. It's tastefully distasteful, so it doesn't show anything that it shouldn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, you know, so, yeah, it's, it's just been, it's been an interesting ride. But 
right now I've got uh, all these different platforms and the main ones that are doing where I spend most of my time on is really Facebook and Instagram. Now the Instagram, I just barely started doing these reels, which are short 15 second videos just this last week. And all of a sudden my Instagram started growing again. Yeah. I mean, I've, uh, I've added like 2000 new followers just in the last four days from doing these reels. Um, that's cause you, you did one of them went really viral and you told me the number on it. how, how it was the emperor's new clothes. Yeah. Yeah. It was just a 15 second kind of yeah, a but funny, what music did you, what music I used did you? a Michael Buble song. <laughs> I'm feeling good. <laughs> and, uh, anyway, it got like 200, it got like a quarter of a million views already and it just continues to grow. Uh, so I, they're not throttling me there yet. And so people can find my work on Instagram and, and get kind of a personal touch uh, of what I'm doing. You know, for the longest time, I didn't do even these kind of things on YouTube. I mean, we would just do these very cinematic videos where I would talk uh, about the painting, you know, and very minimal. But now, you know, I guess it's the way social media is evolving. People want to get to know who you are and, and, uh, you know, like here I am talking on this live YouTube as if you're right here with me and I'm just sharing my thoughts and feelings about what I'm doing. And, uh, you know, it's, there's so much, so much emotion involved when it comes to something you love as much as your country, your family, your God, you know, these are what conservatives believe in. And this is what I focus on in my artwork. And I want it to be meaningful. I want it to capture what's happening in our country. You know, that's why I like to do these sketches because um, they're not something I might do a whole painting on, but at least I can capture a moment in time, you know, with a quote and with a face and they don't take me too long. So here I am writing the actual quote from President Trump. If Biden got in, you'd be paying $7, $8, $9. Then they'd <laughs> yeah, they, then they'd tell you to get rid of take your take rid of your get rid of your car. Yeah, yeah, then they'd say get rid of your car. And he said that uh, I think it was November 2nd of 2020. So he's right. He was prophetic. <laughs> and they made fun of him when he they said. They made fun of him for that. They're like there's no way. But in December, uh there was they they just I watched this montage of all these CNN commentators saying mm -hmm. gas is starting to ease up. It's just now getting under $3. <laughs> oh my gosh. And now it's over $4. It was 4 uh it was 423 uh yeah. here. And and it doesn't sound like a huge deal when you say 423, but when you add it up per gallon every day and you, yeah. and then you have diesel and cars that are, that are relying on that transportation for goods. It's a ton of money. Well, they're saying that it costs the average taxpayer about 2000 extra dollars a year, Jeez. you know, just in gas. So it's, it's pretty much, it's insanity is what it is really. So that was a fun, fun drawing to do. Uh, I called that Biden gas. I have to give a title to these. <laughs> Biden's got gas, right? Biden gas. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I'm selling downfall. prints of these right now, actually. I mean, we're doing this live. I've got a few of these prints left. I did an edition of 50, and I think there might be 10 left. Um, the next drawing that I'm going to show you that I did today of uh, Zelensky, you know, the president of Ukraine. Well, we're going to talk a little bit about that and what's going on over in Ukraine and, and the dynamics of that situation between uh, Ukraine and Russia. Uh, we've just, there's just so much, but yeah, um, it's fog of war right now. Cause it is the fog of war. So we're going to on all sides. We're going to yeah. touch on all the different sides of it. Um, cause it's, it's very complicated and I've been getting a lot of questions from people like, where do you stand on this? What would you do? And, uh, we're going to answer that. So this, uh, print I, I put up for sale today. I did a small edition of 25 
and they sold out in less than an hour. So that's no longer available. Um, sorry. <laughs> I had no idea Zelensky would be so popular. But uh, here I am starting on it. Uh, you can see me drawing his eye. Uh, at first, it looks very abstract. It's like, what is that? You know. <laughs> but uh, it all comes together really nicely. Uh, we've had a couple of comments on this. Um, LJ Jackson wrote, this platform, meaning YouTube, has removed Oliver Stone's movie Ukraine on Fire, but you can find on Rumble. Wow. I've seen, Gosh, I've seen the propagandists, the thought police are out in full force. Yeah, I've seen a lot of those little clips because Oliver Stone actually went out and interviewed Putin, I believe, one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, I think they call them the Putin tapes or whatever. Wow. wow. Um, but yeah, so Oliver Stone's movie Ukraine on Fire, which you can find on Rumble. I, I actually do want to... I do want to watch that. Uh, and Kay Kessler backed that up and said, yes, watch Ukraine on fire. You will understand why YouTube took it down. Wow. That's, that's Interesting. a good recommendation. I love, I love watching videos like this that really dig into stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Because oh, there's just so much information. You have to sift through it all and wonder what's true and what's not. Makes me want to do my Alex Jones voice. <laughs> globalists. You gotta watch out for the globalists. <laughs> you know, I listened to Alex Jones not as much recently, but but I, I've listened to him and he's one of those guys that that you know I I I don't discard everything he says because a lot of times he's right. But at the same time, I don't just immediately say, Oh, that's true, because I I there's a part of me that wonders, you know, how much of this is sensationalism. So I'm just a very skeptical person when it comes to the news. And I think that's a good way to be. But yeah, And I always like to, to look at it from the David Goliath perspective. I mean, like, well, who, who are who are the Goliaths right now who have the money and the funding and the power? Good and point. then look at who's the Davids? Who are these people who are standing up? They, they're trying to do what's right on a day-to-day -day basis. They're taking care of their mm -hmm. flocks. Well, who? And then you got to look at that because, again, remember – that line from Alex Jones that I really liked was the, uh, the Latin phrase, was it uh, key bono? Like who, who benefits? Who benefits? Who benefits from this? Yeah. Um, because who's, who's going to benefit from war right now? And clearly there are some entities within the United States and there's entities within Ukraine and there's entities within Russia that are benefiting from a conflict. Um, so just always, always sift through all of the information that you're getting and saying who's benefiting from this right now. Yeah, yeah. Let's dig into that a bit. But before we do that, I want to talk about Zelensky a little bit. He's an interesting character, you know. He he comes from a background as being a, a comedian of all things, you know. And um, he he came into power during Trump's presidency. And Ukraine had a uh, a reputation for absolute corruption. I mean, they were they almost. Uh, I mean, when you talked about a corrupt government, people would always mention Ukraine, you know, people, yeah. because of all the bribery and things going on in their government. It was almost like a puppet government to Russia at the time. Um, a lot of bribery. I mean, that whole Burisma thing happened, you know, under the former uh, Ukrainian president. And when Zelensky came into power, uh, it was that infamous phone call he had with Trump where he told him that things are going to be better now that 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 they're going to get a um, a hold on the corruption, you know, that's been there before. They don't want that to happen anymore. You know, it was that phone call that led to uh, Trump uh, being um, interesting. That was Zelensky. That was Zelensky. Oh, yeah. and so I didn't Zelensky. Put that together. What's that? I hadn't put it together that it was Zelensky. I knew it was a Ukrainian. I, I thought maybe it was the one before, but it was Zelensky. Yeah. Yeah, and so you know, Zelensky is adamant about getting um, Ukraine kind of back on track and becoming a respected world power, and and all of this, and and uh, you know, he's very he was very much um, appreciated by the people there. But there's so many elements in Ukraine. There still is corruption. There's there's still a portion. Not I don't know if it I don't know if it's very many, but there's still an anti-Semitic uh flavor amongst some of the military military yeah, you were the talking Az about I believe it's the azov the azov military group. Uh -huh. basically they're neo-nazis from everything that i've seen but again 
I'm seeing that filtered through our mainstream media. And then my friends who are in Russia, I have former friends. I have friends. I used to live in Russia. Mm -hmm. They're, they're sending me pro Russia sources that are saying the same thing. I, it's so hard. You got to filter through. Is this? Yeah. Russia I mean, they make it sound as if the entire military is like that, but it's not, you know, uh, I mean, how can you say the Ukraine government is Nazi when you've got Z Zelensky that's Jewish I, I and has know. made multiple um, quotes regarding, you know, his support for Israel and and all of that? Uh, you know, it, it's just complicated. Um, yeah. And he he's definitely pro-West. Um, but, you know, we've got a comment here. Scuba Lady had written. She said, I had high hopes for Zelensky being a good guy, but no, he was installed by the left. And, you know, I it's true. He's been supported by uh, the establishment. And so mm -hmm. then you have to you have to filter that. Is he is he a pro West guy or a pro establishment guy? Like, what does this all mean? Well, he's been leaning a lot on NATO. He's been leaning a lot on these uh, globalists in Europe, as well as, uh, you know, the United States. You know, he's been trying to manipulate the United States government to get involved in this war, you know, which of course would be to his benefit, but not to ours or the rest of the world. Right. So, you know, I, I don't know what to think of him. I, I have to admire him for, for sticking around. He had his chance to get out, you know, Biden offered to fly him out and he said, no, I'm going to stay, which has given him kind of this cult hero status amongst the Ukrainians and a lot of people in the world. Um, you know, so you wonder how much of that was staged, how much of it is real. Uh, it seemed real. Yeah. So Zelensky, you know, right now he's, he, he, he's setting himself up to be a martyr. You know, if they take him out, if Russia is successful in taking him out, which they want to do, they haven't been successful so far, you know, he'll be a martyr. <coughs> so yeah, I'm not sure what to, what to think of all of that. Um, I don't know. Um, it will be, I guess time will tell. And he Probably. was, uh, you know, he, he, you know, his backstory, I mean, he's a comedian, right? But right. Uh, he had that, uh, that basically a sitcom where he portrayed an average Ukrainian citizen who became the president of Ukraine. <laughs> yeah. And, and then they, they went on as the show was going, he, he started to run for president. And then as the show was wrapping up, then he uh he he was elected president it's just it is a weird thing where he 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 was an actor who pretended to be the president and then ran for president and became the president I, it's just it, the it's irony weird. is just in, insane well and then you have these quotes that are coming out that do sound very hollywood very scripted. yeah 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 like the one that i just told you you know that you know i need ammunition not a ride yeah i know is that real? Because I don't know. I mean, it sounds cool. It's a cool line. Yeah. Uh, I, I like it. But did he say it? Okay. You know? I know. All right. So as far as this whole Ukrainian thing, the way I see it, you've got three or four different camps. You've got the Russian point of view. You've got the Ukrainian point of view. You've got the uh, uh, the NATO side of it. You've got the American view from a conservative view. Yeah, that's more than three then. Yeah, well, I said three or four. Didn't I? <laughs> well, because, you know, you, the globalists are both Americans and NATO. But then yeah. you've got a conservative point of view. Yeah. And, you know, my, for me, the bottom line is I don't think we should be involved in any entangling alliances that could put American lives at risk. Yeah. I don't believe that. I, I think that... Uh, Unless it's going to directly affect the lives of Americans in a in a in a bloody war, you know that could actually harm us, then I don't think we should be involved. As much as I hate the images that we see of Ukrainians, you know, men, women, and children being slaughtered, uh, you know, again, you don't know how much of that is being exaggerated, but it's all bad. You don't want to see anybody hurt, but. You know, when people see that, a lot of the immediate response is, oh, we've got to stop it. You know, we have the power. We have the ability to, as Americans, to go in there and save everybody. You know, we got to save the world. And yet we've got so many problems at home, you know. And so 
that's where that's my personal view right up front just so people know i'm 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 against uh war unless it's for the purpose of protecting american lives and american interests now having said that we've got the the nato um north atlantic treaty organization you know the alliance that we made you know after world war ii you know a couple of years afterwards they all these countries including the us got together because we were afraid of the soviet threat which made a lot of sense um and over time you know that's changed and evolved where to the point where a lot of these european countries just seem pretty apathetic as far as what's going on that like nothing's going to happen and yet the united states has been footing the bill for a lot of these countries military since 1942 1944 and so you know when trump was over there uh he made that statement regarding you know germany buying all that oil from uh russia you know and yet america is footing the bill for their defense you know i mean what is that about you know it's not good so so you've got uh nato's nato's view there um where should we start let why don't you tell me your point of view about russia seth because you have some experience over there and you've got some friends in russia what do you think is their their view on everything yeah well i mean i yeah i lived in vladivostok which is the farthest uh um east you can go it's right next to alaska what's the name of that city vladivostok Vladivostok. <laughs> yeah, close. And then I lived in, uh, and then I lived in Moscow. It, it, make sure you, you're, you're in, in frame. You're kind of cutting your, your face off there, off, off the camera. Um, but I'm getting uh, too comfortable, I guess. Yeah, I've been in communication with a lot of my friends there, and and it's interesting. There is a diversity of opinions there in Russia. There are some people who are very anti-war in Ukraine because they view Ukraine as their cousins. Uh, and then there are there are some people who are very pro uh, pro war to the extent of they they believe you know there's there's Nazis in there they got to take them out that's what's that's what Putin is sharing and you know I've seen a lot of these comments here that are coming up and they're talking about the uh, the Azov uh, battalion that's there which is Nazi they've been covering up their patches um, because when people tweet out their pictures you know you could identify that they're part oh, yeah. of the group. Mm-hmm. It's 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 incredibly shocking to see, you know. And then you got all the fog of war, and then so then you have um, people who are allying. The Russians are allying themselves essentially with China uh, right now, and it's just it's so strange to me because I lived in Russia for such a long time that I I can see how the vast majority of them want to be allied with the west they're ready to join the west you know the, the just from an economic point of view you mean or? yeah they just want to be part of the world right they just want to be part of you know they all got smartphones and yeah they're they buying just want to bitcoin do that. and they're just <laughs> but it's the it's it's the it's the governments of both places that just refuse to let go of the conflict because they, they they some i worked for a publisher who told me they regret putting the word peace in the title of one book because they said, they said, peace doesn't sell. Hmm. Um, and so you said, this book is about how to create peace and nobody was buying that book, but there was a book that had the word, uh, it was similar, it was a synonym of conflict. Um, and they said, yeah, conflict sells. And then she, we got all of this conflict going on right now. And there's people again, who benefits, who's making money off of this. There are people, mm-hmm. you know, Putin's making money off of this in some way. The oligarchs are making money off of this in some way. The Ukrainians are making money off of this in some way. Yeah. Right? They evacuated most of those uh, really corrupt politicians. They, I saw footage of them. They had police surrounding them and they were cutting in line in front of all these other civilians, buses and getting out and going to Western Europe. Wow. You know, People are benefiting um, in ways that we don't understand, and it's weird. And so Russians notice that, Americans notice that, and it's it's just it's 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 a mess. It is a mess, and so hmm. it it's tough to say. How does America how does America get involved in a way that doesn't cost American lives? Well, one of the things that I found interesting about Russia, you know. You know, you have the old school Russia. You got Putin, yeah. who, you know, kind of reminisces about the old days of the Soviet Union when they were really strong. And, you know, I, I read somewhere that uh, 
the entire GDP of Russia is about the same as the country of Spain. Or Texas. And yet, really. <laughs> yeah. And so it's not big. And yet they're the second largest nuclear superpower in the world. They're dangerous. And, uh, you know, Putin is kind of like this, uh, this uh, cornered bear. You know, Russia, you don't, you don't want to poke the bear. And, you know, since the collapse of the Soviet Union, the Russians have been trying to hold on to their power, their, their sense of uh, strength. Um, and they've watched like uh, these other states, Soviet states, uh, you know, there was like seven of them, Yugoslavia and Bulgaria and some of the other ones that joined NATO. And NATO is the enemy of, of Russia. So it would be kind of like if the United States was to fall apart and Texas and Florida and a bunch of these states decided to join, um, you know, Cuba or, some, or a bunch of, you know, Russia, if it was on the southern border. I mean, the, the northern part of the United States would feel like like they're, they were at risk, you know, risk of uh, invasion because they, they, they don't trust NATO. They look at NATO as the evil enemy, the Nazis, if you will. And so there's this innate fear with, that Putin has that Ukraine will eventually join NATO and uh, they can't have that. They won't allow it. And so they're willing to, to risk everything to secure their what they think is their security and it doesn't mean it's right i mean ukraine is a sovereign nation right now you shouldn't they shouldn't be allowed to do what they did but the here's the part here's the thing that blows my mind okay back in 1994 uh bill clinton brokered a deal between ukraine and the soviet union it was called the uh the nuclear disarmament act uh, the the trilateral statement uh, part of the Budapest Memorandum, all these that all these names for it, and basically, Ukraine would give up the uh, nuclear weapons that they kept when they, the Soviet Union collapsed, because at the time, Ukraine was the third largest holder of nuclear weapons in the world, and the leaders in in Kiev didn't want to keep those, and so they wanted to give them to the United States. The United States didn't want them, so they gave them to Russia. And part of the agreement was that the United States, Britain, um, and uh, some of the other NATO countries promised that they would protect Ukraine uh, from any invasion. You know, doesn't that just, that just blows my mind when I hear about that? Because uh, I think it was in a few years later when the, uh, the Russians went in and took Crimea which was considered a part of Ukraine at the time, and nobody did anything about it. You know, we were too busy with Afghanistan and other stuff. Well, and Obama was just weak. He's Obama just weak. was weak, you know, and I, I have to wonder when he made that uh, statement on a hot mic right before uh, the 2008 election. Wait, 2012. No, 2012? Yeah, it was yeah right Obama. before that. And he, and he said, you know, I'll have more flexibility after the election. Mm-hmm. I wonder what he was talking about. You know, they never did anything. And so they that whole agreement pretty much evaporated. And so now, you know, the Trump's out, Biden's in, he sees a weakness, and um, he's willing to risk it, risk everything, Putin is, to go in and take control of Ukraine. But we've never been closer to a, a world war scenario than we are now. And a lot of it is going to depend upon how the United States and NATO react. If we start putting up a no-fly zone and pushing uh, weapons into Ukraine, that could just blow up the whole thing. That's we, got a comment. we got a comment here from JT Parr. He says, the West demonizes Putin, but if you sit and listen to any of his press conferences, of which there are plenty, he tells you exactly what he wants and doesn't want. And that's true. Very um, true. I because I speak Russian, so I'll watch them in Russian, and he's very clear like over and over again for years. He says mm -hmm. exactly what he doesn't want NATO to do, and he says it over and over again for yeah. years. He's been very and specific, that, yeah. And he says, Don't do this. And and even, even uh, this crisis right here, we're kind of acting like it's coming out of the blue, or at least the media is acting like it's coming out of the blue. 
but he was lining up troops for months and months and months oh, yeah. and months. Uh, uh, I mean, Putin has been warning the West for many, many years. Don't do it. Don't do it. Because they, they drew their, their red line in the sand, yep. you know, and because they, they feel threatened by NATO. Uh, yeah. And so, I mean, I can understand his point of view. Uh, you know, he's thinking of Russia's own interests. But I really put the blame on the West and the way we've kind of managed this whole thing. We should have stuck to that uh, that uh, trilateral statement, the the Budapest memorandum, and held held their feet to the fire and tried not to antagonize the situation. I mean, we're we're really making things worse. That's how I see it. Well, and and also we made a bunch of promises to the Ukrainian people, which we are obviously not keeping which is, right. is tragic um because they were relying on nato or they're relying on us to back them up in some in some way and it just doesn't seem like we're going to be helping them at all you know no. and i feel terrible for the ukrainian people it's always it's always the innocent who suffer the most yeah from these decisions that are are being made these strategies that are being made by really evil people wherever wherever they are yeah. Um, whatever country they're in, the innocent people are suffering the most. And I, I feel my, my, my heart bleeds for the people of Ukraine. No, I agree. It's a sad situation all around. I just don't want America to get involved. I don't want us sending military aid, you know, humanitarian aid. Yes. Military aid. No. Um, I just, I just hope that, uh, that, they don't do something stupid, but they've done so many stupid things. My, <laughs> yeah, we're, yeah, we're dealing with the Biden administration. We're dealing, mean, dealing with the emperor that has motto. no clothes. We're dealing with an, an, an entire administration that has no clothes. Everybody sees it. So that's kind of where we're at. And uh, this is my sketch. You can see I uh, wrote the quote on there. Uh, the fight is here. I need ammunition, not a ride. So they do need to they need more than they've got i don't know if they're going to get it and so i i do feel bad for the ukrainians uh boy so much to unpack in today's uh talk um it's nice to have seth here with his uh his point of view regarding russia i don't know all the answers i'm trying to figure it out myself just like a lot of you but i appreciate all the ideas that you share with me uh, regarding paintings, you know, sometimes people will send me ideas for paintings and occasionally I'll consider them. Um, and there's just so many things that would make a good painting right now. It's, you know, the artwork, the artwork's important because those images really capture the feeling of what's happening in the world today, especially uh, from a conservative American's vantage point. That's what I'm trying to do. So thanks for taking time to be with us tonight. And uh, until next time, make sure you subscribe to the channel. If you've stuck around this long, you better subscribe. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, and also pray for me that I can do my next painting and make it as good as I want it to be. So until next time, thank you.